Hello and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, it became clear that the burden of the disease fell disproportionately on certain populations. Mortality rates were initially reported by race, and they revealed that Black and Hispanic Americans were dying at higher rates than white Americans. And as more data emerged, it became clear that people living in denser housing or engaging in work that required in-person contact with others and those with chronic health conditions were all at elevated risk. These data led some to propose targeting the life-saving vaccines as they emerged to the communities where the risks associated with COVID-19 were the highest, using what were called vaccine equity policies. So did these vaccine equity policies save lives? That's the topic of today's episode of A Health Policy. I'm here with Chris Hoover, Director of Research and Evaluation in the Santa Clara County Public Health Department. He was working at the California Department of Public Health when he did the work that was published in a paper in the 2024 issue of Health Affairs, along with co-authors, that assessed California's vaccine equity policy. They found the policies had their desired effects, increasing vaccination rates and decreasing COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths among populations disproportionately affected by the pandemic. We'll discuss these findings in today's episode. Dr. Hoover, welcome to the program. Hi there, Alan. Thanks for having me. Very happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. This is a topic where we're looking back, but it tells us a lot about how we might think about things going forward. So I gave a very brief introduction to the notion of a vaccine equity policy or an equity-focused approach. Why don't you expand on the very light touch I gave the topic at the beginning and say a little bit about why California felt that it needed to take an equity-focused approach to vaccine allocation. Yeah, well, as you mentioned in the intro, we saw very stark COVID-19 disparities in terms of cases, in terms of mortalities, in terms of hospitalizations very early on in the pandemic, regardless of how you stratified it. You know, you can stratify by race and you see this, you can stratify by some of these area-based measures of social vulnerability that we relied on a lot and you see the disparities show up. So the COVID-19 disparities were very stark and we wanted to do something about it, right? And we we took a look at the data when vaccines were first coming out, and we saw in particular that about 40% of these COVID-19 outcomes, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, were coming from the 25% of the population that lives in the lowest quartile, the lowest 25% of this area-based social vulnerability index, the healthy places index that we used for this analysis. So that motivated this approach to send 40% of the vaccines to those areas. And just to dive into the thinking there a bit more, if you think about the underlying drivers of those disparities, some of the things you mentioned in the introduction, like inability to stay at home and work from home, inability to kind of separate yourself if you do have infection because of high density housing, other uh, social vulnerability factors, those same factors are are also likely to lead to disparities in, in vaccination access and vaccination uptake. So those people might not have the time to take away from their workday to go to a vaccination appointment. They might not have the same healthcare access to actually access the healthcare system and receive a vaccination as, as other folks might. We were worried that those same underlying social vulnerabilities that lead to the disparities in COVID would also lead to disparities in vaccine uptake. And so we saw the vaccination rollout as an opportunity to to try and pull a lever and rebalance things so that those people um, that didn't have adequate access to vaccination for all these same reasons that were leading to COVID-19 disparities um, kind of tip the scales in in their favor and make sure that they get the benefits of, of vaccination. So I, uh, I certainly don't want to simplify this, but this is sort of a standard public health approach. You look out at the population, you see the burden of disease falling heavily on a subset of the population, and you say, wow, if that's where the problem is, we should focus our solution there. You mentioned basically targeting 40% of the vaccines to this 25% of the population uh, in the highest uh, uh, risk. Can you just, maybe if you could just provide a little more sense of uh, what it means to target and what communities you're really talking about here? 
The area-based measure of social vulnerability that we used is based on the Healthy Places Index. So this is a measure developed by the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. It was at the time uh, exclusive to California. Since then, it's spread to Utah and I think potentially being implemented in other states now as well. It brings together a lot of different factors and then is kind of normalized to life expectancy at birth. So that's kind of the outcome that it's really anchoring on. And it, it gives us a sense of opportunity to live a healthy life is, is the way it's kind of described. We were using this to look at where these disparities were coming from, where, where the populations most affected were. And it also gives us the ability to connect the disparities to a method of implementation in terms of vaccination. So vaccination distribution was happening at the zip code level. And the original Healthy Places Index was actually on the census tract level. And we had to do some some, some statistical methods to get it to the zip code level uh, to match the, the implementation scale that we were sending vaccinations out on. But from there, it was really just we can identify the lowest quartile. We refer to this as, as Q1 in the paper and, and whenever we talk about this work. So we identify these communities that are in this lowest quartile. Again, we see 40 percent of the outcomes are coming from those 25 percent of the communities. And so the first thing we do is just say, okay, we need to send more vaccinations to these areas, make sure that the supply is not constrained in those areas. So when this policy was implemented, we were still in that phase where vaccinations were not widely available for everyone. We had just kind of vaccinated elderly people, essential workers, healthcare workers, those sorts of populations. And this was sort of the first phase where vaccines were becoming available to to the general population, but they were still supply constrained. So it was difficult to get an appointment. So that was the other thing that we layered on top of this policy was send more vaccinations, but also make sure that the vaccines that were getting into these uh, HPI Q1 areas were going to those people that live in those those vulnerable communities. So we were making sure that the vaccine appointments in those areas were actually reserved for people residing in those areas. And then we also provided a lot of support to the local health jurisdictions to try and implement mobile vaccination clinics, outreach to these communities, and those sorts of things to ensure that we have the adequate supply and then we have the outreach and the infrastructure and the resources available to to get the shots in arms, if you will, uh, to the people that really needed them in these communities. So I think it's a really important point. It's not just the allocation, it's the infrastructure to assure that that allocation yields the maximum rate of vaccination among a population that otherwise might be uh, less likely to get them. So your goal in doing the study was to figure out whether or not this policy saved lives and achieved what it set out to do. We don't tend to focus a lot on methods here on this podcast, but I think it would be helpful probably for our audience to understand sort of how did you frame the question and and how do you go about trying to answer it? Yeah, absolutely. So we we kind of had two different approaches, one for the actual vaccines and then one for the COVID-19 outcomes. And for the vaccines, it's actually a fairly straightforward policy analysis. We used an approach called the difference in differences, where we have our communities that were targeted and we can look at them before and after the policy and compare what happened before and after the policy in those targeted areas to what happened in areas that were not targeted by the policy uh, before and after the policy. And the vaccines themselves are easy to assess in this way because we know exactly when and where people were getting their vaccines, right? So it's a very proximal, okay, people are getting vaccinated, here comes the policy, here's how things change. And you can see that in our first table in the paper, just in the raw data, you can see that the rate went up quite a lot in those Q1 communities that were targeted by the policy. And they went up everywhere else because supply was increasing, but they didn't go up quite as much in those other quartiles uh, that were not targeted by the policy. And then, you know, when you look at the results from that analysis, it's a very consistent finding that the, the vaccination rate in those targeted T1 communities increased ostensibly because of the policy. Now, with the COVID-19 outcomes, we, we get a lot more complications. So you're getting shots in arms, but then you also have testing rates that determine if a case is actually identified or not. You have differences in exposure where some people, you know, there might be variability in when and where people are being exposed and potentially getting sick and then turning up as a case and, and the data sets that we were using. You also have this multi-vaccination regime, right? So it's not just one shot, it's multiple shots until you're considered protected. All these complicating factors that make the question around analyzing COVID-19 outcomes and assessing the effect of the policy quite difficult. So we had to turn 
to this modeling approach where we try and find a model that does a good job of capturing what we observe and what's happening in the real world and use that as a sort of in silico counterfactual world where we can then go into that in silico world that we think represents what really happened pretty well and start turning off levers that are associated with the policy in the model to see, okay, in this counterfactual world without the policy, what might have happened? And that's the approach that we took was we found a model that did a really good job of recreating what happened in the real world. Then we go into that model, turn off the coefficients associated with the policy, use that to generate this counterfactual estimate of cases of hospitalizations and of deaths. And then we compare that to what was actually observed. And we use that to estimate our outcomes averted. So how many cases, hospitalizations, and deaths were averted because of the policy in this sort of counterfactual to real world comparison. As a top line, what can you tell us about vaccine administration and about the COVID-19 outcomes based on the policy that California adopted? Yeah. So for vaccine administration, our top line estimate and that sort of basic difference in differences analysis, adjusting for county as well. It was about a 28% increase in the vaccination rate in those targeted Q1 communities. And we actually did a lot of sensitivity analyses to really drill down and make sure that this effect that we saw uh, was consistent. And there are some varying estimates in terms of the magnitude, but we found very consistent evidence that the policy led to an increase in vaccinations in the targeted communities. For COVID-19 outcomes, we found that about 160,000 cases were averted from when the policy was implemented in early March through the end of October. So that was our analysis period was March through October for the COVID-19 outcomes. We chose this time period because this was, you know, when the vaccines that were allocated because of the policy were still relevant. You know, people still had immunity because of those vaccines that they received as a part of the vaccine equity allocation, but it was before things like boosters and the Omicron variant that emerged late in 2021 came around and and would have really complicated the effect of the policy on the outcomes. So in that time period, March through the end of October, yeah, 160,000 cases, about 10,000 hospitalizations, and almost 700 deaths were averted uh, because of the policy. And the cases and hospitalizations estimates were pretty pretty consistently significant, even early on after the policy. The deaths estimates kind of fluctuated in terms of significance. So every once in a while, that lower confidence interval kind of overlapped zero, implying that that estimate wasn't quite significant. And I'm happy to kind of talk about our ideas around why that might be. But yeah, just to want to kind of level set there and say that the deaths estimates were kind of not always significant um, in the after policy period. So we have a pretty clear picture that the policy had overall its intended effect. I want to talk about sort of what you do with these results in terms of thinking about the future and preparing for the possibility of needing to do this again. Let's hope not too soon. We'll have that conversation after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Chris Hoover about California's COVID-19 vaccine equity policy. We just learned that based on the analysis conducted by Chris and his colleagues, they feel quite confident that the rate of vaccines in the more disadvantaged communities was notably higher as a result of the policies, and that the health outcomes are also notably improved, although the death estimates, of course, are the most sensitive to the limitations of the work. So I think the answer to this question may be obvious as a outgrowth of the answer you gave earlier, but you mentioned sort of creating this hypothetical world where these policies weren't in place. And that's kind of the world we would have lived in had California just said 25% of the population, 25% of the vaccines. Here's another 25%, right? If, if we just sort of did it on a straight numerical basis. So what would the COVID-19 picture have looked like, do you think, in that counterfactual world had none of these policies been put in place. Yeah, so one of the good things and interesting things about this counterfactual approach is we can kind of really dive deeply into this this alternative counterfactual world and get a sense of what might have happened in that world where the policy didn't happen. And one of the things we wanted to look at was 
what would that ratio of outcomes coming from those most disadvantaged communities look like if this policy hadn't have occurred. And so that is what is in, I think, exhibit three of our paper, where we look at, absent the policy, what ratio of COVID-19 cases would have been coming from those Q1 communities without the policy? And then what did we actually see in terms of the ratio of observed cases in the real world coming from those Q1 communities? And what we see is absent the policy, that same sort of 40% of cases coming from those Q1 communities that motivated the policy itself would likely have persisted. So we would have continued to see this much higher risk in terms of COVID-19 cases coming from those Q1 communities sustained across that entire after policy period from March through the end of October. And when we compare that to what's actually observed in the real world, we we do see this decline in the ratio of cases coming from those T1 communities. And it very briefly at two different time points, I think in late May and then early June, I don't remember the exact date here off the top of my head, but it did kind of touch briefly. So the ratio of cases coming from those Q1 communities was proportional to the population in those Q1 communities. And that kind of implies that there was an absence of disparity in those time periods. Now, the caveat here is that those two time periods where we did touch on sort of proportional risk to population were very, very low COVID-19 activity time periods. So they were the sort of the lowest COVID-19 case rates that we had seen and really have seen since almost. So things are looking pretty good right now, actually. But that time period just after that big vaccination rollout was kind of our nadir, the low point in terms of COVID-19 activity for most of the pandemic. And so it was just in those very, very low activity periods that we saw this sort of even distribution of risk. And you can look in the appendix for the same analyses for hospitalizations and deaths. And it's not quite as clear. We do see this reduction and the disproportionate impact on on Q1 communities, but it mostly showed up in, in terms of cases. And then the last thing I'll say on this is that we did get those brief two time periods where we saw that proportional risk. So again, cases proportional to, to population. But for the most part, we didn't reach that. We were not at 40% that whole time, but we weren't at that sort of quarter of the population and quarter of cases, both coming from these most disadvantaged communities either. So we might have reduced the disparity, but we didn't necessarily eliminate it entirely. Now, we can sit here a couple of years later and sort of talk about this uh, somewhat dispassionately, but at the time, uh, there was a lot of controversy. First of all, as you note, and I think it's really important that our listeners understand that these policies rolled out at a time when there weren't enough vaccines to go around. As you noted, we've uh, distributed them to the very high priority populations. But now the question is sort of, what do we do? And I, I mean, I remember the news stories of people going to all kinds of trickery to try to get to the front of the queue. So California adopts this uh, using the neighborhood as a unit of analysis. And you mentioned earlier the sort of the difference between zip code and and census tract. We don't need to get too much into that. But I, I think it would be helpful for me to understand the rationale behind and the importance you ascribe to using neighborhoods as the unit of analysis for thinking about how do we have equitable and equity focused uh, allocation of vaccines. I think a lot of this comes down to implementation. So, you know, in an ideal world, we'd be able to identify the 25% of the most vulnerable individuals in the state, perhaps, and make sure that they get a vaccine if if they want one. But we don't have the capability to do that. We don't have the capability to actually identify those people on an individual level, and then we don't have the ability to reach out to them individually and, and make sure that every one of those individuals gets a vaccine if they want it. So it comes down to implementation mostly. I think, as I as I mentioned earlier, the vaccine distribution and delivery was happening on the zip code level. A lot of these additional efforts to make testing appointments available, do mobile vaccination clinics, do outreach collaborating with community-based organizations, those sorts of things are really happening on the neighborhood level. And then I think the other thing on that use of neighborhood is just that, you know, neighborhoods are cohesive. Neighborhoods have a social structure, they have relationships, they have community-based organizations that are already established. So we can leverage those kinds of existing relationships and infrastructure to implement the policy. And then from an analytical standpoint, this 
gives us the data and, and an approach to do this kind of analysis where we look at neighborhoods and look at outcomes coming from those neighborhoods. And there are very well-established methods to analyze these types of things um, sort of on a, a zip code or census tract level. So, yeah, I think it, it really comes down to implementation is the main thing. And again, we use the Healthy Places Index, but there are a lot of other area-based measures of social vulnerability, like the Social Vulnerability Index, the Area Deprivation Index, that can be used to do these same sorts of equity-focused policy implementation and and then subsequently analysis and, and also identification of disparities, right? So this is a very common line of work where these area-based measures of social vulnerability are used to identify disparities and, and target resources and those sorts of things, um, but still, I think, not utilized as much as they could be to do this sort of equity-focused policy implementation and targeting. Well, as we come to a close, I want to circle back to a comment you made earlier. You note that there were these few brief periods where the COVID-19 cases of this one quarter of the population that's most vulnerable were about a quarter of all the cases, which would be equity. But those were short-lived, and they were at the lulls in the epidemic. And that, in fact, although your paper, I think, quite clearly shows that the policies reduced inequities did not eliminate them. So putting your sort of public health uh, hat on here and your understanding both of the data and the context in which you work, can you say a little more about what you think it would take to not have those two points be anomalies or uh, short-lived, but actually a more sustained approach to equitable outcomes should we face, whether it's a pandemic or some other condition that we know is going to fall disproportionately on those with fewer resources. Yeah. So I think in this very specific case for COVID-19, for vaccine distribution in the supply constrained environment, we had this very clear lever, this very clearly effective medical countermeasure in terms of vaccines that was targeted towards this one health outcome that was the major issue at the time. And also setting where we had the ability to identify the people most in need quite easily, and then get them this very effective intervention in the supply-constrained environment. So it was this sort of perfect environment for this kind of equity-focused policy, and it had a big impact. But I think a lot of other health equity issues are a lot more convoluted, and there's not that sort of silver bullet that that gives us this very clear, here's the one thing that we should do at this time to, to have an impact. So I think it's a lot harder, but it, I think it comes down to addressing a lot of these social determinants of health. So underlying disparities in terms of healthcare access, in terms of economic opportunity, social structure, structural racism, you know, all these factors that we know have a huge impact on patterns of health across populations, across racial and ethnic groups, across geographic groups. They're, they're a lot harder to target, but we do have the policy levers that we know are effective to target some of these underlying social determinants of health. It's just a matter of getting the sort of political and economic will to have a stab at intervening on those outcomes and, and seeing what the downstream impacts on health equity are. And I'm excited and optimistic that uh, we, we'll start seeing some more of those big picture structural changes that might lead to improved health equity and improved health outcomes for all populations, but it's going to take a lot of work to, to get there. Well, that seems like the right place to end this on a note of some optimism, but also the need to do a lot of work to get to that more optimistic place. Dr. Hoover, thank you so much for the research you did here, uh, for presenting it, and your continued commitment to trying to achieve these effective policies. Thank you for being my guest today on a Health Policy. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about a health policy.